We continue with our study on the book of Hebrews, Substance and Shadow, and we are already in chapter 11. And uh, I've titled this one, The Gallery of Faith, and before we start, let us have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this magnificent chapter that takes us in a walk through the gallery of faith where we can see that those that went before us struggled and came out conquerors. Bless us as we study their works so that we may emulate them. In Jesus' name, Amen. This is to me one of the most magnificent chapters in the whole Bible because it is so encouraging and it's almost impossible to take one chapter and to elevate it above any other. But it's just that it brings it down to the personal level. And it also well, tells us about some of the problems that we have in the world today. So in chapter 10, we already addressed the big three spiritual components of the Christian walk, faith, hope, and love. And in chapter 11, we hone in on faith without which it is impossible to please God. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13 says, And now abideth faith, hope, and charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. Now, this word charity is the same as the King James translates as the word love in other portions of Scripture, like, for example, in 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 3, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience and of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. So the same word, agapeo, is translated charity over here and love over there. Now, this word charity comes from the word caritos, and it has an element of works associated with it. So, personally, I would have liked it if they had just translated it as love, even, even though there are different forms of love, but this particular love, as we know, is the selfless love, the agapeo love. 5 verse 8 says, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. It's interesting, the helmet, of course, covers the cognitive part of the brain, and uh, it is the one where we have not only faith and love, but where we embrace this hope that things can change. Some people think that a gospel that tells us of what is going to happen in the world, like Matthew 24, for example, deprives us of hope. But in actual fact, when we see the things developing around us and we see the way in which the world is going, our hope should not be fastened Upon anything down here, we should lift up our eyes and our heads and look because our salvation draweth near. And that should be the Christian hope. Romans 8 verse 24 says, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, what does he hope for? But if we hope for that which we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. So hope is incredibly important and we must cling to it. So the question is how great must our faith be? Matthew chapter 17 verse 20 says, And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. So we must have faith, even if it is the size of a mustard seed, but there's another question that arises then. 
Should it stay a mustard seed? Luke chapter 13, verse 18, Then said he unto me, Unto what is the kingdom of God like? And whereunto shall I resemble it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and cast into his garden, and it grew, and waxed a great tree, and the fowls of the air lodged in the branches of it. So our faith should not remain the size of a mustard seed. It should grow. It should wax into a great tree. And the only way in which we can accomplish that is by experience, repeated experience, continuous walk in the way. So what is the definition of faith? Hebrews 11 verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's to me one of the most amazing definitions that I've ever read in my life, partly because it is so nonsensical. Because faith cannot be substance and it cannot be evidence of things not seen. It is an impossibility. I always use a rather silly example, but uh, let me use it again. If you are in a court of law and the judge asks the witness to come forward and to testify as to what he has seen, and the witness says, Thine honor, this is what I did not see, then that would be a pretty nonsensical thing to do and the case would be dismissed. So, faith is the substance of things hoped for. So, if you're hoping for something, let's say you hope for a gift, such as a new car, does the faith in this hoping for the car provide the substance? In other words, if you have faith that you will one day get a car, can you go and sit in the car and drive away? The answer is no. But what if your faith is so strong that you are absolutely convinced that the substance, the car, is yours even though you cannot yet see it? Well, then it is something else. And what is evidence of things that you have not seen? Provide us with the evidence of what you saw. Know thine honor, this is the evidence of what I did not see. It doesn't make any sense. But this is the definition of faith, and without it, it is impossible to please God. So we need to study it in some detail. Here's a statement from the Spirit of Prophecy. To the distressed father, seeking for the tender love and pity of Christ to be exercised in behalf of his afflicted son, Jesus said, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. All things are possible with God, and by faith we may lay hold on his power. But faith is not sight. Faith is not feeling. Faith is not reality. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. To abide in faith is to put aside feeling and selfish desires, to walk humbly with the Lord, to appropriate the promises and apply them to all occasions, believing that God will work out his own plans and purposes in your heart and life by the sanctification of your character. It is to rely entirely, to trust implicitly, upon the faithfulness of God. If this course is followed, others will see the special fruits of the Spirit manifested in the life and character. It's very important that love is not evidence. It is not feeling. It is not reality. It is something that you appropriate that is not yet there. So sometimes people, when they become discouraged, feel that God has abandoned them. But the Word of God says, I will never leave, nor leave you nor forsake you. So then faith must pierce the shadow 
and grab hold of the substance and say, even though I don't see it, even though the circumstances are stacked against me, by faith I will accept that he has not left me nor forsaken me. And we will need this faith more and more as we approach the times that are ahead of us. So, in my own words, I tried to summarize as following. Society rests on a faith which is rooted in man. This is what we see on a daily basis. We see it in the media every single day. We have been schooled to place our faith in man and in the inventions of man. Every advertisement that we see on, in the media makes a promise and is successful insofar as men believe it and act upon it. The entire economy runs on this principle from our first breath to our last. We trust the physician that delivers the infant. We trust the formulas which are fed to them, the food we eat, the stores we buy our food from, the education we receive, the science we learn, the bankers that take care of our finances, the preachers we listen to, the religious systems we belong to, the decisions of those that rule over us, and the news that feed us. If we trust all of these things, we can be in serious, serious trouble. Many follow blindly and do so without questioning the sources, and those that do are branded conspiracy theorists and fanatics, and they are often removed from society. So in all of the above, there are three elements. There's a promise. If you buy this, this and this will happen. There's faith. I'm sure it will happen. And there's a response. You buy it. Whether it is a statement that you buy from the lips of your teacher, whether it is a statement that you buy from the lips of your pastor, whether it is a statement that you buy from the lips of the bankers or the politicians, if you buy it and you have faith in it, you vote for it, and sometimes you vote yourself into oblivion. So the same criteria apply to the voice of God in the scriptures and in nature. But who has believed? Psalms 50 verse 1 and onwards says, the God of gods, the Lord, has spoken and he has called the earth from the rising of the sun to the going down thereof. Out of Zion, the loveliness of his beauty, God shall come manifestly. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall burn before him and a mighty tempest shall be round about him. That's the promise of the second coming. Question is, do we believe this? Are we so acquainted with his character that we actually look forward to this? Or are we afraid that uh, things are not right in our lives? Or are we afraid of chains and rather cling to what we have, a shadow of a world, and deny the substance, this faith that has been promised the substance that has been promised. So Isaiah 53 verse 1 mournfully asks, Who has believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Sadly, the answer is, most have not believed the report. And even within God's supposed people, there are people that say, Oh, please don't let him come yet. So Hebrews 11 verse 2 says, For by it, by faith, the elders obtained a good report. And then comes the list of those that gave us this good report. Verse 3, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. That's the first statement of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God and that the things that we see were not made from things but they were made ex nihilo out of nothing. 
I almost want to <laughs> use an explicit and say, how much of the world actually believes this? A tiny, tiny minority believes this. Does the educational system of the world believe this? Absolutely not. What is taught in our schools? What's even taught in our primary schools? Anything but this. In fact, the exact opposite is being embraced by the world. The theory of evolution has totally negated verse 3. It has been swallowed not only by the philosophers of science, but by the very scientists that are producing the substances which are supposed to save humanity in the days that we are living in. So the question is, does the world have faith? And the answer is no. It does not have faith, particularly if it believes the lie that is being propagated in the world regarding this very issue. So it's a sad state of affairs that the very first statement of faith is negated by the entire scientific world and embraced by the religious world. So even the supposed people of God that stand in the pulpit will defend the voice of science over and above the word of God. A very sad state of affairs. And as we go down the line, Hebrews 11 verse 4, by faith Abel, offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. That is the second statement. It goes right back to the Garden of Eden. By faith, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice. If we ask ourselves the religious systems of the world, do they embrace the religion of Abel, that the substitute should die for us, that there would be an atonement that would pay the price for our sins? If you take the great religious systems of the world, they all deny it. And even in the Christian world, it is denied as verily as Cain denied it. And we've seen in the previous chapters how they deny the atonement of Jesus Christ and how the whole world can sit around one table in a happy ecumenism with those that deny the atonement of Christ and claim that they are brothers and sisters in Christ. Now the sad state of affairs is that the people that are involved in these systems are blissfully unaware of the official teaching because they've never learned to question. They have been ritualized. And that is why it is so important for the enemy of souls to ensure that people are ritualized so that they block out their cognitive functions. The faith of Abel is not the faith of the religious world nor is it the faith of many in the supposed Christian world. Verse 5, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now Enoch serves as a type for the antediluvian world that God would fulfill his promises. And Enoch was taken to heaven just as Elijah was without seeing death, as a guarantor for those living at the end of time who will be alive when the Lord will come, that they too will be able to see God without facing death first. Now, is this believed in the world today? Well, I've heard many, many sermons I've heard even the Nobel laureates of this world, like the Desmond Tutus of this world, stating that the story of the resurrection is an allegory, that it never happened. Or the Jesus seminar that says Jesus was probably eaten by dogs. There was never a resurrection. This is purely a story, a figment of the imagination. And this is the supposed Christian world, the Nobel laureates and the bishops of this world. By faith, Enoch 
Is that believed in the world today? No, but he's in the Hall of Fame as he's able. So it is difficult to walk with God in the midst of a wicked world with myriads of temptations, but Enoch did. Was this written down long after the translation of Enoch as a reminder of his achievements or was it an example of what we can achieve by faith in the time that we are living in? These things are written, says the Bible, for our example. Everything in the Bible is written for our example. And every word in the Bible is God-breathed. That is what we have to accept by faith. And if you want to have the faith of Enoch, then you must walk with God in the midst of a world as it is today, where every imagination of the heart is continually evil, as it was in the antediluvian day. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 says, Now all these things happened unto them for ensamples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So what are the consequences of not having faith? And we see that the world doesn't have faith. It doesn't believe anything that is written in those first three pillars of faith or a minute fraction of the world believes it. Well, verse 6 is the consequence. Without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. The religious world has said they can embrace atheists as long as they are people that walk according to the common good. But without faith in God, it is impossible to please him. So God's gallery of faithful men and women includes people from all walks of life, from the most noble to the most ignoble occupations and from the highest to the lowest stature in society. The issues of faith also stand in stark contrast to the issues that the most brilliant minds in this world hold dear. It is the absolute antithesis of what the world believes. Let us continue. By faith Noah, in fact you don't even have to go further than that, already the world stumbles being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. What a magnificent verse. I remember when I was an atheist and an evolutionist and I switched to becoming a believer in God's word and in creation. I had so many discussions with my colleagues. And one of my colleagues, who by the way, who was an elder in the church, in the Christian church, when I asked him, what about the universal flood? He said there was no universal flood because it was a a paleontologist, and they don't believe in a universal flood. In fact, evolution cannot tolerate a universal flood. And so I asked him, what about it? And he said, no, it's a figment of the imagination. And then I said to him, but what about Jesus? He's an elder in the church. What about Jesus? He said, when the flood came, he took them all away. And his answer was, Jesus was lying or he was ignorant. By faith Noah. It's a sad state of affairs that my academic colleagues didn't have any faith in terms of what Noah believed. And so they have influenced thousands and thousands against what the Bible defines as faith. There are organizations run on campuses by the Christian world that represent Christianity and they make it their business at the universities to train people to turn their backs on the myths of the Bible so that they do not look like fools in the eyes of science. Well, one day they will look like fools 
in the eyes of God because the Bible says the fool says in his heart there is no God and the fool says in his heart there was no flood. Let's continue our walk of faith. The world really is in trouble so far. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in a land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which has foundations whose builder and maker is God. Well, how many people believe that in the world today? This is the gallery of faith. Abraham, when he didn't even know where he was going to go, obeyed. He left his home. He left his family. And he went. And he wandered in a strange country dwelling in tabernacles and he was waiting for a city which has foundations whose builder and maker is God. A literal city. And people say that is foolishness. And so the world today preaches a millennialism or millennialism on this earth. Either way, they are not looking for a city. Roman Catholicism and conservative Protestantism teaches amillennianism. There is no millennium and the kingdom of God will be eternal and the church will rule here on earth. The Bible says my kingdom is not of this world. So how do you reconcile those two issues? And the Protestant world, the Pentecostal world in particular, they teach a millennium, a thousand years of peace and safety upon this earth when the Bible knows nothing. In fact, when they say peace and safety, the Bible says sudden destruction will come upon them. So if you read Matthew 24, surely it doesn't speak about peace and safety. So how many people have the faith of Abraham? How many people are willing to come out of her, my people, to walk destitute in the world, spiritually speaking, without comfort, waiting and looking for a city that God has prepared for them that love him. Very, very few. But that is a requirement. God says, come out of her, my people. And if you refuse to come out because you love the shadow and refuse the substance, then you have a problem. Hebrews 11 verse 11 is an interesting one because it says through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Well, if you want to talk about mustard seed faith, then I think Sarah qualifies. What did she do? when the angel announced that she was going to conceive, she laughed because she thought it impossible. And when she was confronted, she says, no, 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 I, I, didn't, I didn't laugh. No, no, no. But she had this tiny little seed of faith and she's placed into the Hall of Fame. That can surely give us some courage as to how much God expects in terms of us. We have many weaknesses. But there she is in the Hall of Fame. Therefore sprang there even of one and of him as good as dead, speaking about Abraham, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. He believed there was a city. He believed it was going to be his abode. And he was willing to wander amongst this wilderness of this world, not having received the promises. Because it says in verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises. But having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them 
and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And this should be our attitude. These all died in their faith, not having received the promises. And if we go to the book of Daniel, Daniel was also told to wait for the promise, because in verse 13 of chapter 12 we read, But go thy way till the end be. Thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of days. You will go and sleep, Daniel, but when you are resurrected, then you will be heirs of the promise, together with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Sarah and all those that believed the promises of God. Now, we are living in a time when we have an opportunity, and I believe it is a very distinct opportunity, that we will be able, like Enoch, to see the coming of the Lord without seeing death. So embrace the promises. Grab hold of the substance. Verse 15 tells us there's no turning back. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. If we borrow from verse 38 for a moment, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. If you've made this decision to follow this walk and the, and the obstacles become so great that you think that you cannot surmount them, if the anakim are too large for you, then trust in the promises. Don't be like the ten spies. Be like the two. Say, yes, I can do this. Together with God, we can move this mountain and tell him to move from there to there and the obstacle will go away. Are we facing obstacles? Absolutely. Is there legislation in the card, on the cards that will put us in a straight place? Absolutely. And where is our hope? Where is our strength? Where is our help going to come from? By faith. Grab hold of the substance. So they could have returned. Did the Israelites want to return to Egypt? Absolutely. Did Abraham return? No. But he lingered. He lingered for a while in Haran. And he had to have a second call to come out. And the same with this world. There are two calls to come out of Babylon. And the final call is right now. Because many a Protestant soul and many a Christian soul is lingering in Haran. They should come out. They should come out and go into the wilderness and wait for the heavenly city because this earthly one will not become a reality. Verse 16, And now they desire a better country, that is a heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. I think we should, we should study this a little bit further. So, in other words, if you believe that there is a literal heavenly city that God has prepared for them that love him, then God is not ashamed to be called your God. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. This is amazing. So, in other words, those that are the laughing stock of the world who believe that Jesus Christ is going to come again and take us to where he is where he is also according to John chapter 14 you become the laughing stock of the world then god is not ashamed to be your god Hebrews chapter 2 verse 11 said, Remember, for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. So God is not only not ashamed to be our God, he is not ashamed to call us brethren, brothers and sisters in Christ. This is amazing. So let the world laugh. And let us have faith. 
So if God is not ashamed to be our God and to call us brethren, then we should not be ashamed either, even though the world mocks. Psalms 190 verse 18 says, Let my heart be sound in thy statutes, that I be not ashamed. In other words, study the word of God, accept it as the truth from Genesis to Revelation. Oh, the book of Genesis was not written by Moses. It had more than one author. Chapter 1 is different to chapter 2. Chapter 1 talks only of Elohim. Chapter 2 talks about Yahweh Elohim. So are there now two authors? Because in the first chapter, it talks about God as plural, and in the second chapter gives the Creator a name, Yahweh, the I Am. Is it now a second author? And what about all the other books? Were they written by the people that wrote them? Oh no, they were written after the event, like the book of Daniel, for example, long after the event, excuse me. Daniel predicts to our present day, so no matter where they want to place him, they are in trouble. The question is, did Jesus believe the book of Genesis was written by Moses? He referred to it many times. And he told the scribes and Pharisees, as it is written, Moses said the following. So he believed that Moses wrote it. If Jesus believed it, that should be good enough for me. How many times did we read what uh, Paul wrote about Moses. Or what about the book of Job? Was Job a mythological figure? Just a silly story in the Bible? But Jesus himself said that the righteousness of Job would save him in the day of calamity. So Jesus believed in Job. And we can take chapter after chapter in the Bible and we can see that Paul quoted them. He quoted the book of Leviticus, he quoted the book of Numbers, he quoted the book of Exodus, he quoted the book of Genesis, he quoted the book of Job, he quoted all of these books, he quoted the Psalms. He believed, Jesus believed, but his followers don't. They think someone else wrote it. No, 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 we must not be ashamed and we must let our hearts be sound in thy statutes. As it is written, so it is, irrespective of what some brilliant person, even if he has a white coat on, has to say. Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. 2 Timothy 1.12 for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which he has committed unto him against that day. We need to have this experience. We need to trust. We need to develop faith. Romans 10 verse 11 says, For the scripture says, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. These are wonderful promises. But if they are not yea and amen in our lives, they mean nothing. Matthew 10, 32 says, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. And then Luke tells us that he will confess them us before angels of God if we confess Jesus before men. So we mustn't be ashamed. I remember what it was like when I first started. How am I going to do this? <laughs> By practice, it becomes possible to say, this is the way it is, this is what I believe, and I don't care what you say and what you say to the contrary. The Word of God says this, and I have come to believe it, and it is the Word of God, and it is immutable then if we are enemies as a consequence, let it be so. Verse 17 continues with the faith of Abraham and says, when he was tried, he offered up Isaac. 
And he that received the promises offered up his only begotten son. This must have been an amazing test. And it was given, of course, as a type of the great sacrifice that Jesus was made. This was a far greater challenge than what Adam and Eve had. And this came after millennia of sin on the planet. And Abraham stood the test. He had many faults and many failures. But here he believed God, which is more than what Adam and Eve did. They had a simple test. This was a far more difficult test to perform. And then it says, Of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. So the Bible says that Abraham was virtually dead, sp speaking in terms of his productive or reproductive capacity, when he conceived Isaac, and now he was asked to offer him. But he believed God, and he believed that God was able to raise him up from the dead. He believed in the resurrection. And so he was prepared to do it if God requested it. Hebrews 11 verse 20 says, By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning the things to come. So he inherited this faith. He also had to walk his way and find his way to this faith. And he had to wrestle with the angel. And yes, his hip was put out of joint. But sometimes it's necessary that we go through this world with a limp or maybe lose an arm or an eye rather than lose the kingdom of God. Let's go through a chiasm in chapter 11. And this one has an A, B, C, D and a C, B, A structure. In other words, there's again a central portion in the middle that we need to highlight. Hebrews 11.13, these all died in the faith. And if we go to the counterpart, which is A asterisk, it's Hebrews 11.19, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. So this is the issue of faith. They all died in the faith. What was the faith? He believed that he could raise him from the dead. So he had faith. B. Not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. The counterpart is by faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises, offered up his only begotten son. So this is basically a chiastic structure with a contrast in it. So not having received the promises, he was still waiting for the city, but he never received it. But he did receive Isaac, and he was asked to offer him. And he was willing to offer his only begotten son, his one and only, his unique, his monogenes. So that was faith. And then see, for they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And Hebrews 11.16, see is the counterpart with an asterisk. But now they desire a better country, that is a heavenly. And what is the center of this chiasm? 11 verse 15, And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from which they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. Why didn't they return? Because their faith became substance. They believed what God had said and the Bible says it was accredited to them for righteousness. Verse 21, By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped leaning upon the top of his staff. He was an old man in other words. And he kept his faith to his old age and when Joseph brought his sons he reversed the blessing and Joseph was most unpleased and tried to take his hand and change change the blessing but with his prophetic eye he saw the future and by faith 
Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph, taking the younger and placing him above the older. And he worshipped, leaning upon the top of his staff because he was old. Now, if, of course, you have the Douay Rhymes Bible, which is the Jesuit version, it reads, By faith Jacob, dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and adored the top of his rod. Now, this is such a ridiculous translation. But the world thinks that it is fine to associate with people that propagate idolatry to this sense. They've removed the second commandment of idolatry out of their catechism and therefore change the wording so that it includes idolatry in this section. It is absolutely astounding that people can go that far. Hebrews 11.22 By faith Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. This in itself is another interesting one because Joseph knew that the children of Israel were going to depart and he gave strict instructions that his bones should be taken out and carried away. And the Bible tells us that that is exactly what happened. When they left Egypt, they took the bones of Joseph with him. And now we have archaeologists in the world, the scientific white coats of this planet, who tell us that they have found the tomb of Joseph and his bones in Egypt. Is that faith? No, that is believing the lie so that you can propagate the lie and make the word of God to none effect. The world does not fit into chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews. So where Joseph prevailed, we can also prevail. It says in Galatians 5, 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Here was a man who had integrity, and he fought against the lusts of the flesh, and ran away from the wife of the one that he was serving. And we can do the same. And he kept his integrity, and he kept his faith. And in fact, Joseph is one of those examples in the Bible that smacks of perfection, just like Daniel. But when Daniel prayed, he associated himself with those that were sinful. He never elevated himself self in any way. Verse 23, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child. So this actually refers to the faith of the parents. And then this amazing statement, these parents, they were not afraid of the king's commandment. And if we go to Moses himself, by faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He could have become the next Pharaoh choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. He believed the promises of God. And so by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. So he had the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Both his parents and he were not afraid of the king's commandment. Moses not fearing the wrath of the king. The question I have for the people living in the world today, do they have fear for the wrath of the king? Is there a king? Is there one that we should fear that is a counterpart of the king of Egypt? Is there one that says, who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice? I am above the Bible and I will decide what is right and wrong and I will determine the common good for all of humanity 
And I will decree that my mark shall become the mark of obedience in the entire world. And if you do not follow my mark, you will not be able to buy or sell. And I will force and coerce you to do it. Is there such a king? And if you do not do it, I will put you in prison and I will slaughter you in the end and I will deprive you of your children. Is there such a king? Is there such a king who could issue death decrees such as that, who can force you to partake in rituals of death? Well, they were not afraid of the king's command, and neither was Moses afraid of the wrath of the king, so then neither should we. This is an example of faith. This is the time that we are living in. Hebrews 11.28, Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. So now we're going back into the religious connotation. What did he believe? He believed in the efficacy of the blood of the Lamb for our salvation, and not the decree of an earthly king that promises you an utopia and a truly human life here on this planet and calls that salvation when it is a pile of potash. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians are saying to do, were drowned. We are facing a Jordan experience, and we will have to go through that sea very shortly. The armies will be behind us, and the rope of faith will dangle from a sky without a hook in front of us and we will have to grab hold of it and swing across the chasm if we want to get into that other land. Is it difficult to face the wrath of the powerful? Is it difficult to be despised by those who should count you as brothers and sisters in Christ? Will our faith hold when church and state and false brethren and sometimes well-meaning brethren are arrayed against us? Will we hold on to our faith? Verse 30, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. This number seven appears over and over again in the scripture and it will be just as important in the time that we live in. By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. In the same way, the stones are beginning to cry out and I believe that many a person will grab hold of the substance and leave the shadow behind. And there are many, many Rahabs in the world. Many religious systems contain many, many people that will embrace the truth and say, surely the Lord God is with you. And I know that this city, this earthly city, will be destroyed. Therefore I will cast my lot and hang a red lint, testifying my faith in the blood of the Lamb, out of the window, on the wall, and on the wall means in accordance with the law. And that portion of the wall never tumbled down, but the rest did. Hebrews 11.32 and what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Yaphthe and of David and of Samuel and of the prophets. I mean, just reading this list is absolutely amazing. How much faith did they really have? Gideon, how much faith did he have? What he did do in the end, didn't he erect idols? and start worshipping them? What about Barak? Barak was so afraid he wouldn't go unless the female prophet accompanied him. And so he was deprived of the glory and a woman conquered his enemy. What about Samson? Is he in the Hall of Fame? Yes, he is. Did he mess up in his life? Absolutely. Did he stick to his vows? He really struggled. He had a serious problem. And what about Jephthah? 
And what about David? The only one here who is squeaky clean is Samuel. What about the prophets? All of them had, the Bible says, like passions, such as we are. But the difference is they had faith, even if it was like a mustard seed. So it tells us that through faith they subdued kingdoms, they wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. What a, what a marvelous gallery of faith. It gives us hope when we look at these people. Verse 36, And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. I think he's including himself there. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, referring to Stephen, for example, where he stood by and watched them stone him to death, or Isaiah that was sawn asunder. They were tempted, they were slain with a sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, of tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. So I thought I'd include a picture of the cover of Fox's Book of Martyrs. I don't know how many of you have read it. It is a exceedingly depressing book to read because it just lists one after the other. It is like a modern Christian hall of fame, like a Hebrews chapter 11 of the Christian world. Revelation 6 verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. When I read Revelation, it says that he was on the Isle of Patmos, says John, for the word of God and the testimony. This should make us think as a people to the word and to the testimony, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, they have no light in them. And the remnant of the seed that keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony. When are we as a people going to wake up to these realities? Here they are waiting under the altars and their lives were a testimony in itself, not only the words that they spoke. Verse 39, And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promises. So, this should make us think. God having provided some better thing for us, for they without us should not be made perfect. Everybody is lying in state, except a few that served as a type of, and as an encouragement to those that should come after, such as Enoch, such as Elijah, such as Moses that was resurrected, such as the first fruits that came out of the grave, and Jesus took the captives with him. But for the rest of humanity, the Abrahams, the Abels, even the Adams of this world, they're all lying and resting, waiting for the resurrection. Nobody has received the promise because they together with us should be made perfect. We are living in that time. The Bible says, of whom the world was not worthy. Three times in the King James Version, the words are, walk worthy. Ephesians 4 verse 1, Therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. When we are called, we have a particular task. We're not supposed to sit on the knowledge and keep it to ourselves. 
We are supposed to share. We are supposed to be apostello, sent, siloam. As Jesus was sent, so we are to be sent. We have a particular vocation. Walk worthy of that vocation. Colossians 1.10 That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So if we want to walk worthy, study the Bible. Not only study the Bible, have fruits in accordance with the word. And then 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 12 that you walk worthy of God, who has called you unto his kingdom and glory, waiting for that city. Now, in a previous one, we already said, a house without someone inside it to share it with, to have this agape relationship with, is empty. We're not looking for a house, we're looking for a home. So the actual relationship should be with God, so work, walk worthy of God. May God give us the courage and the strength to emulate those that went before us because the times that we are heading towards will require that all of their attributes are consolidated in our very beings. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the example of men and women who walked according to their faith. And Lord, none of these were perfect. They all had faults. They all struggled. But they all came forth as conquerors, even if it was at the very last moment, as in the case of Samson. So Lord, as we wait for a heavenly city, a city whose maker and builder is God, may we display a faith that others would wish to emulate, that they too may be partakers of that glory, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.